you don't need me to remind you that there are several words in the life of the church that are unique to the church that are strange to outsiders. Fellowship, evangelism, discipleship, these are words that most people don't use on a daily basis, of course. Sometimes that can be a barrier to the simple gospel message. Because it is such a simple message, we don't want to burden people with uh, the idea of having to learn an entirely new language uh, to become a believer. If we do that, then we've added to the gospel. But on the other hand, these words have meanings. And we should understand those meanings. We should not stop using very good meaningful words just because they are rare words. We should remind ourselves of the meaning. So this morning we're looking at one of those words. We're looking at the word discipleship. As I said, it's the word that we don't use very often in the secular realm. It is almost solely limited to church life. But it is a crucially important word. What is discipleship? This is the eighth mark as we look at the nine marks of what it means to be a healthy church. And to be a healthy church, we must have a biblical understanding of discipleship. Not merely an understanding of discipleship, but the right practice of discipleship. So what is discipleship? Well, last time we looked at church discipline. As you can probably understand, the same root word is at play in both of those ideas. And as we said last time, discipline is both positive and negative. It is both formative and it is corrective. But we said it all rises from our love for Christ and our love for each other. A large part of the formative discipline. Remember we said that that's the positive side of church discipline and it's basically what we're doing right now. Anytime you're sitting in a Sunday school class, you're hearing someone read the Bible, you're participating in a prayer meeting, whatever it is that you're doing can be a form of discipline because it is moving you to greater love and devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we are at this very moment participating in a form of formative, that is, positive church discipline. Well, that's where we have the word discipleship. And so in a very real sense, discipleship itself is a part of church discipline. So what is discipleship? Here's a good definition, or at least a passable definition. Discipleship is the process of growth or Sanctification, that's another one of those big words unique to the church, of a Christian in which they not only gain biblical instruction, but they live out the truths of Scripture. It's very dangerous to misunderstand discipleship merely as learning things, right? Uh, we, most Southern Baptist churches don't do it much anymore, but we used to have uh, that hour prior to evening service. Most churches don't even have evening service anymore, but there used to be an hour even before evening service that was called discipleship training. Uh, it was a hour devoted to discipleship. And so what you might be led to believe is that discipleship is just learning things about the Bible, just learning things about Jesus. That's only half of the story. Because if we don't live out what we have learned, we are not becoming more mature disciples of Jesus Christ. Discipleship does not end with my own individual growth. So let's say I learn things about the Bible. I learn things about Jesus. I learn things that He wants me to do. I learn what it means to be obedient. And then let's say I take it a step further and I actually put those things into practice. I actually strive to live a life of holiness. I actually work to be obedient to the Lord. I love the people of God. I love the things of God. 
I love the Word of God. I'm learning the Word. I'm living the Word. Well, even then, that's not the end of discipleship. Because discipleship is not merely about my individual growth. It's about making other disciples. What is the great commission? Jesus says, go make disciples teaching them what to obey all things that I have commanded. We don't just teach all the things that He commanded. We teach to obey all things that He's commanded. And so the discipleship circle is not complete until we're actually working hard at making other disciples. Now, one way we do that is through evangelism, right? Just the sharing of the gospel. But many of you, most of you, are involved in discipleship of other people and you may not even realize it. When you make a comment in Sunday school class, when you counsel someone in a very informal way, somebody calls you up and needs some advice about what to do and you point them to Scripture or you quote a Scripture to them or you direct them to a Scripture, that's part of making disciples. So even then, you're fulfilling the Great Commission in an indirect way. Even if you're not sharing the Roman road with someone and leading them to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's vitally important that a church have a vibrant, active program of discipleship. What that means is it happens informally, but it should also happen formally. And we should be intentional about growing one another. Everybody is about growth. We want to grow. We want to grow in every way. But the main way we want to grow is spiritually in our holiness, our obedience, our love, our devotion, and our worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that when it comes to discipleship, when it comes to the life of the church in general, God has given us responsibility for the depth. He takes care of the width. What I mean by that is many churches reverse that. Many churches put the cart before the horse. And they say, we need bigger buildings. We need bigger crowds. We need bigger budgets. So what do we need to do to draw bigger crowds? We want to grow. And when they use that word grow, they are talking primarily about numerical growth. And so they begin to pursue pragmatic, consumer-driven marketing schemes to attract people to their meetings. They're focusing on the width. How big are we? How numerous are we? The problem oftentimes, not in every case, but oftentimes, they're a mile wide and an inch deep. That kind of growth is not discipleship growth. What I want to do, what we want to do as a congregation, is we want to go deep in the things of God. Now, when I say go deep in the things of God, that doesn't mean the more big words we can learn or the more we can do this or that. That's not what I'm talking about. When I say go deep, I mean going deep in understanding what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And the more we train our people, the more we disciple one another, the deeper we go in the things of God, then the natural outflow of that is going to be what God takes care of, and that's the width. That's true growth. When people come to know the Lord, Jesus Christ, in a saving way, we are disciples and we make disciples all for the purpose of looking more like Jesus who has saved us. So, what does the Bible say about discipleship? Probably the single best passage of Scripture for discipleship is a passage that we actually looked at not long ago. It's in the book of 2 Peter. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I want to examine this passage with you uh, for a bit. I want to begin in verse 3, and I want to read through verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, and we'll read through verse 10. 
This is an explicit teaching about discipleship. What is discipleship? How does it function in the life of the believer? Verse 3 begins, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing... They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. What a word from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the pen of the Apostle Peter. And what we are reminded of is this simple truth. Salvation does not end at the point in which it begins. What I mean by that Salvation in Jesus Christ is more than a one-time, point-in-time moment and experience of conversion. We are converted. Remember, we've talked about that. The, the, the vast majority of the marks of a healthy church have to do with the Gospel. A biblical understanding of the Gospel. A biblical understanding of conversion. A biblical understanding of evangelism. How we share that with others. But that's only the beginning of the story. The Bible rarely, if ever, emphasizes, it does on occasion, but it rarely emphasizes the beginning of the race. It always emphasizes the end of the race. Now, you do have exceptions to that. We've got a great deal of emphasis, say, for example, in the book of Acts on the Damascus Road conversion of the Apostle Paul. Great emphasis on how radically he was changed. And that's some people's testimony, right? Some people's testimony is a stark difference between their lives lived in darkness apart from Christ as opposed to the amazing and brilliant life that they lead after Jesus changes them. And so they may have a testimony uh, of the nature of, of how uh, you know downtrodden they were and they had addiction and they had immorality and they had all these bad things. And then just in a moment, Jesus changes them and they're forever changed for the good. But that's not most of our testimonies, is it? Most of our testimonies, uh, or at least mine I should say, it does involve me having a drug problem, but it was the fact that I got drugged to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night that existed. That's more in line with the testimony of folks who are raised in the life of the church. But it doesn't end there. Can you imagine the Olympics are, are coming around before long? Can you imagine the, the world is watching as these runners are taking their places on the starting blocks? It's the 100 meter dash or whatever it is. It's the big one. It's the big race. And they're set and the pistol fires and there's one runner who takes off amazingly quick. He comes out of the blocks far faster than any of the other competitors, but 
three steps into the race, he stops and begins to do this. He had a great start, but guess what? He loses the race. The Christian life is not about the brilliance of your testimony regarding initial salvation. It's about the difficult daily work of taking up your cross and following Him. And friends, it is a race to be endured. It is, it is not full, it is not a life full of candy canes and lollipops and cotton candy. Christian life is often marked with suffering, with difficulty. And it's in those times of greatest pain that God often teaches us the most about Himself. That's discipleship. Now, as Peter describes this, it's evident that none of that is to say that your initial saving faith in Christ is not important. I mean, in other words, there was a time when you weren't saved and then there's a time that you are saved. So there is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. He is, as Scripture says, the author and the finisher of our faith. You can't start the Christian life without Christ, and you can't finish the Christian life without Christ. And every moment in between is centered on and dependent upon Christ alone. So can you say this morning, very simply, I am saved. Can you say, I was saved and I can remember that time? Now you may not be able to, I know evangelists sometimes when I was young came and said, if you can't remember the day and the hour and the minute that you prayed to receive Jesus Christ, then you're not saved. Well, it doesn't happen that way for everybody. But, but do you know that there was a time in which you put your trust in Jesus? You put your faith in Him alone. Then you can say, I was Saved. But that's a phrase that we throw around quite a bit. But it's really what Peter's talking about in these verses in 2 Peter 1. What does it mean to be saved? Well, he tells us. Verse 3 is the answer. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. It's quite simply that God, by His divine power, has granted to us, now listen carefully, all things that pertain to life and godliness. Isn't that good news? You are not, spiritually speaking, you are lacking nothing to be all that God desires you to be in your growth in Jesus. He has granted you all things pertaining there is nothing you can add to it. You are spiritually the person who has everything. That doesn't mean you are as mature as you can be. It means you've got all of the tools at your disposal. You've got all of the Holy Spirit at your disposal that you need to be not conformed to this world, but transformed to the image of Christ. It's that word everything that is the prominent point of the sentence. God has equipped you in Jesus Christ by the knowledge of Jesus Christ in His gospel of death and resurrection. Everything you need for life and godliness. It's extremely encouraging. And equally important, God in Jesus has done this. He alone has granted this. To Him alone belongs the glory and the honor and the praise. You can't claim any of the credit for this. Why can you say you are saved or you were saved? Because God liked you more than somebody else? No. It's by His grace. For His own glory and excellence, He says in the verse. And according to verse 4, He's granted us Precious and great promises. What promises? Well, in verse 13, we see, uh, or following, we see that a part of this, or in verse 11, excuse me, 
For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's a promise that we can take to the bank. It is so certain from God's perspective, it has already occurred. But even more immediate, it's that we're partakers of the divine nature. For what purpose? That we would escape the corruption of the world. So when we talk about being partakers in the, the n- nature of God, you know, it's not like a, a, a comic book situation where, oh, then I can know all things and I can fly and I can do this. It's not that kind of superhero idea. It is that you are a partaker in the nature of God's holiness and His perfection in particularly morality and how we behave, how we act. We have the Holy Spirit. Is there anything more we could ever need than God Himself dwelling within us? So, I can say I've been saved by grace through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But that's only the beginning of the process of discipleship. And most of us are very comfortable saying that we're saved. Or we have been saved. But as I ask you when we looked at this passage initially, I would ask you again, can you say, I am being saved? We don't don't speak in that way normally. And you may say, wait a minute. We can't get saved again and again and again. Some may believe that, but it is not biblical. You don't get a little more saved today than you did yesterday. That's not what we mean when we say we're being saved. Let me explain. When you were initially saved, point of conversion, you put your faith in Christ, you repent of your sins, several things happen in and around that time. Regeneration. You're born again. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins. You are justified in God's sight, which means He legally declares you not guilty, even though you are guilty, because He imputes the righteousness of Christ to you. So all those things happen when you got saved. That, that's, that's extremely important to remember. But at that time, you began a new process of growing in Jesus Christ. We call that sanctification. And it doesn't, for most people, it doesn't look like this. It it looks like the most unstable stock market graph you've ever seen. It's like this, and and then it goes up, and you know, you go to the revival, and it's up here, you go to camp, and it's up here, and then reality, it's down here, and it's all up and down. But on the whole, the curve is up. You're growing. Doesn't mean you're not going to have errors and mistakes. It doesn't mean you're not going to sin. But it means that you're growing. So that starts at conversion and it continues through all of life. You're being saved. That's not language that I come up with. That's biblical language. Let me mention a couple of places that that occurs. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I can get there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. A little bit later in that same book of 1 Corinthians, if you turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, It's a great chapter on the resurrection. He says in verse 1 and 2, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Which means a kind of belief that is mental assent only and not a genuine trust and dependence on the Lord Jesus. 
In 2 Corinthians, he uses the term again in chapter 2, verse 15. I'll start in verse 14. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So the, the if you look at the verb tense there, he, he contrasts those who are in a constant, ongoing, perpetual state of being saved and those who are in a constant, ongoing, perpetual state of perishing. Right? There are people all around us who are in the process of perishing. They don't realize that they are, but they are. And there it will come a day when they will perish. So we can equally say, I have been saved, I am being saved, and one day I will be saved. In the final, ultimate glorification sense of the word, saved. Until that day, I'm being discipled. I'm growing in Jesus Christ. Now, this is extremely important because too many people think that salvation is a one-time event. And you know, if you've known me for any length of time, you know my biggest soapbox in the world is, you know, these kind of emotional experiences that have no resulting change in life whatsoever. Doesn't mean you'll be a super Christian, but it does mean that there is a new relationship with the Lord Jesus that didn't exist before. And if that's the only thing you think of when you hear salvation, listen to what Peter says back in 2 Peter chapter 1. Look very quickly at verses 5 and following. For this reason, make every effort. So now you're doing something. Up to this point, you hadn't done anything. God regenerated you. He granted you the gift of faith and repentance. He justified you. He adopted you. He put you in union with Christ. But now, there's sanctification. Now you're involved at a level that you had not been. Verse 5, make every effort. And then he goes through this list of qualities. And then in verse 8 he says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing... They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. So it's something I'm working at. And then, if that were not enough, look at what verse 10 says. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. So there's an activity to this. Now think about the difference between these two ideas. Someone might say, well, you know, I'm saved. I didn't do anything to get saved. So I guess, since God is sovereign, then I guess He's going to make me into whatever He wants me to be. So I really, I'm good. Well, guess what? What does that result in? He says it. Unfruitfulness. Ineffectiveness. On the other hand, what he does tell us to do is to make every effort to confirm, to, to make our calling and election sure. So what does that mean? It means I want to produce fruit. I want to be obedient. I want to grow closer in my walk with Christ. I want to see other believers grow in Christ. I want to see non-believers come to faith in Christ. And I work hard to accomplish that. I make sure that it's taking place. Now, how, how does that happen if we can say that we have nothing good to add? If we've got nothing good to add, then, then why should we make any effort at all? Because of what he said at the beginning. We've been granted all things that pertain to life and godliness. You've been granted the Holy Spirit. I work but not in my own power. Best passage in regard to this idea comes in Philippians chapter 2. 
if you want to go there. I'm just going to read it very briefly. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12 and reading through verse 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, now listen to what he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. That means work at it. But I thought there was nothing good within me. That's true. Because look at the next verse. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. You work, you work as if everything depended on you, while knowing everything depends on God. You can only accomplish what you accomplish by the power and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is the means by which we have any hope to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Do you see how God has provided the perfect solution to a balance between not thinking we're saved by our works on the one hand and on the other extreme thinking, well, God's sovereign so I don't do anything. Kind of a lazy slothful way. It's a both and. We work and God works in us. Now, we have to remember, as we've said time and time again, that our ethical behavior, what we do, is not the root. It's not the beginning of our salvation. It's the fruit. It's the result of our salvation. Michael Horton has said this, get on with life, with love, with service, fully realizing God already has the perfect service He requires of us in His Son. You can't do anything to please God more than He is already pleased, not with you, but with His Son, who is your substitute. So if He's already perfectly pleased with us, that doesn't mean I have a license to do anything or nothing. It means I have the freedom to do even more knowing that it's not dependent on how good I perform. What a burden lifted to know that my eternal state is not dependent upon my performance. Everything in this world is based on performance. It's based on a system of ungrace. It has nothing to do with grace. You want good grades? Then study more. You want the promotion? Work harder. You get what you deserve. Everything is ungrace. But salvation is exactly the opposite. I got what I didn't deserve. Eternal life. That is so freeing to know that it's not because of anything that I have done or will do. But that freedom does not translate into negligence or uh, license to sin kind of immorality. That's what a lot of people think about Baptists. And anyone who believes in perseverance of the saints, they say, well, you believe in, you believe in once saved, always saved. You, you can't lose your salvation. And they think that we believe that so that we can have a get out of jail free card or some kind of fire insurance and we can do whatever we want to. They think about it almost like a Roman Catholic indulgence, right? And we know better. The fact that we are going to persevere does not free us to sin more, it frees us to serve more. So as you are evidencing fruit, you're being sanctified. You're being saved. Now, let's transition into the final thought, and that is, why is discipleship important? We've talked about what it is and what the Bible says about it, but why is it important in the church? 
Well, if, if a church does not constantly emphasize ongoing growth and maturity in the life of its members, in the life of the people in the church, it could have very dangerous and unhealthy consequences. We see this often in churches that have little to no emphasis on discipleship. I've even heard, you can, you can search it, you can search, see it on YouTube, whatever, pastors standing before their congregation and saying, the purpose of this church is not to feed you, is not to grow you, it is to evangelize the lost. And so every week when they stand in the pulpit, if you could call it a pulpit with a straight face, you, you, they're, they're, they're speaking to unbelievers. They're preaching to goats, quite literally. And that they, they don't do that by mistake. It's what their goal is. And they will tell their people, if you want deeper teaching, you need to go to a church that is all about that. It's so unbiblical. Yes, we want people to come to Christ. How does that happen? By discipling the people. When we are discipled and we're growing in Christ, then people come to know the Lord. Not just by... What what hubris to think that there's something about my preaching that if, if we can just get the lost people here and they can hear my eloquence, that they'll come to Christ. Strips Christ to the glory. He alone saves. And, and if we don't practice biblical discipleship, it might give false assurance to someone who's not genuinely converted. If they're always just hearing these very surface kind of teachings that really never go any deeper, then they think they're good. They think they're fine. It's only when they're challenged with deeper truths stronger truths, meat of the Word, that they begin to say, wait, now that's not exactly. I When I um, went and did um, postgraduate work at uh, Southern Seminary, uh, I had graduated from seminary with a, a, a master's degree, MDiv. I had pastored for three years and I, w- I was kind of uh, arrogant. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was arrogant. And I was filled with pride, and I knew everything that there was to know. And uh, it's kind of a repeat of my earlier sin in childhood when my mom would say, or my dad would say, come on, it's time to go to church. And I would say, I already know all those stories. They can't tell me anything I don't know. Well, as I went to do postgraduate work at Southern, in my very first doctoral seminar, I sat down and in, in, in uh, doctoral work, it's not like a classroom, it's you just kind of around a table and it's, it's, it's more of a uh, uh, discussion-based thing. And so as a student, you, you don't just soak in, no, you're expected to contribute to the conversation. And, and so to make a long story short, these guys started talking. And I just, I just kind of, so I'm sitting here and I'm proud. And they started talking and I just kind of, you know, went, these guys were brilliant. And, and they were saying words and talking about concepts and ideas that I never even knew existed. And, and I, you know, just felt like a, a blubbering idiot and I didn't have anything to say. And, and, and what my point of that silly illustration is, is if you are never challenged to go deeper, you will have a certain level of satisfaction. Here's a simpler way to understand it. If you love basketball, will you ever get better if you only play people who are less capable than you? How do you get better? You play people who are better. That's why our goal in the church is to sharpen one another. 
and to bring one another on, along and never be satisfied. That's why discipleship is so crucial. One more thing. A second thing, if a church doesn't constantly and consistently practice discipleship, it might leave believers, lead believers to think they don't need to fervently pursue holiness. And here's what I mean by that. If they're told that they're all good in Jesus because our church is big, we've got a lot of money in the bank, or any number of external measures, then they're satisfied and they're complacent in the same way again. So it does a disservice. If we're not discipling one another, we are doing one another a disservice. So many Christians might measure other things. But here's the final point that I want to make, friends. The only certain observable sign of growth is a life of increasing holiness rooted in Christian self-denial. And these things are nearly exempt in the church. Why? Because their goal oftentimes, not in every case, you know I'm speaking in broad generalization, but their goal is, is not to grow believers deeper into Christ, but it's some other ulterior motive. What my goal is, what our goal is, is that you grow deeper in holiness. We often pray that explicitly. Lord, I pray that these people, I pray that I would leave this place with a deeper love for You, a greater desire to pursue holiness than when I came into this place. And when we recover true discipleship, then we build the church by growing deeper in God's Word and the result is being a clear witness to the world. So, we are discipled when we learn what it means to follow Jesus. We don't merely learn it, but then we practice what we've learned. Would you stand with me as we close our time?